All righty. Well, hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Monterey Bay Aquarium and the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute's live stream feeds all around social media. Let's transition us away to this group of presenters here, our merry band of marine science folk here. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much, everybody, for being there. Uh, my name is Patrick. I'm right here in the middle. If anything breaks here during this broadcast, if suddenly we're upside down or we're looking at dolphins, that'll be my fault. Uh, over to this side over here, we've got the other half of the social media team, the better half. We've got Emily. Good morning, Emily. Thanks for being there. And hey, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us. Awesome. And then all around us, below and uh, in every corner, we have uh, a wonderful, wonderful colleagues from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, or MBARI. We've got Susan over here on the side. Susan is uh, part of the social media team. Uh, down below me is Cassie. Cassie is going to be looking at your comments over there all across social media, as well as George Matsumoto over here in this corner down there. He'll be answering your questions. And our esteemed guest today uh, is going to be uh, Kakan. Katija, uh, who's in that lower corner there, and actually I'm going to uh, spotlight you right now. Uh, Kakani, if I can figure out how to do that. Nope, that's Emily. Hold the phone, everybody. There's Emily, and there's Kakani. Kakani, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, good morning. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So we are going to be chatting with you today about some bio inspiration in the deep sea and all of us here are going to be a part of that. But let's see if I can just do a very quick introduction to the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute here for everybody. So let's get going to that. Uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute is located in Moss Landing, about 20 miles north of the aquarium. And at Embari is uh, a really amazing group of folks that are working aboard research vessels, like here, the Rachel Carson. You can see there in the background, the Moss Landing power plant there that's very iconic of the area. Um, this is the RV Western Flyer. And aboard these vessels are really amazing instruments, in particular ROVs, or remotely operated vehicles. This one here is the Ventana, our window into the deep sea. And here is the Dock Ricketts, which is aboard the Western Flyer. And these ROVs go down into the deep sea with HD cameras, loads of scientific instruments that allow us to study the deep ocean. And what's really incredible about our backyard in particular is that the Monterey Bay is home to uh, a submarine canyon, the Monterey Submarine Canyon, as it were. That's where these ROVs are going into the deep sea. You can see here from this animation, we've got the Moss Landing Harbor there, which leads out into the deep ocean directly offshore. This is essentially like having the Grand Canyon underwater. It's a mile from the rim of the canyon down to its deepest point with another mile of water stacked up on top, essentially two miles deep of water out there. And here's that map of the Monterey Bay area with, uh, with the aquarium there on the south and the moss landing there in the center at the head of that submarine canyon, which means that the deep sea is directly here in our backyard. And that is where uh, Kakani and co are able to go out and study what's going on there in the deep sea. They're watching it from the research vessel on these screens you can see here. And uh, yeah, with that, that's Mbari, and I'm gonna cut back over to Kakani seamlessly if I can right here. Okay, awesome. So Kakani, can you introduce us uh, to yourself, your job at, uh, at Mbari, and then a little bit about what we'll be talking about? Uh, sure. Uh, well, thanks you know, for having me on uh, today. Uh, my um, position at Mbari is a principal engineer and I lead the Bioinspiration Lab, which is comprised of a number of researchers and engineers that are all interested in you know, developing technology that enables us to observe and study animals in their natural environment in the deep sea. And part of the reason why we're interested in doing that is to really you know, not only observe these animals, but to understand what they're doing you know, to survive in such a difficult environment and the, with the goal of perhaps someday being able to reverse engineer what they're doing and apply it to other technologies. Um, so that's 
like in a nutshell what I do at Mbari. That's excellent. Uh, and can you tell us a little bit about the animal that you have there behind you there in your background? And I'll actually start playing some videos there of, uh, of our friend there in the background. Tell us, who's that behind you? Right, so this animal here is Batho Bathocordius stygius. It's one of three um, species in the genus Bathocordius in Monterey Bay. And um, the animal, I'm gonna try and do this. The animal is this bluish thing right there. That what I'm pointing at is its head. And then this blue, um, object here that also extends from its head is its tail. Um, but then everything else that's around it is actually a mucus structure that the animal secretes and blows up a lot, a lot like a balloon. Awesome. And behind, uh, behind you right now, I have you uh, picture in picture there, Kakani. We have one of those big mucus nets with what look like those lungs there in the middle that the larvation is uh, fluttering its tail there inside of. Can you describe to us uh, quickly maybe what a larvation is? It's a, it's a word that most people probably haven't heard of before, but actually close cousin to, uh, to us people here, right? Right. Um, in fact, uh, these animals are what we call basal chordates, or if you look in the tree of life, they're essentially the, um, our closest invertebrate ancestor. Um, and so this is part of the reason why larvations are, are really interesting, um, just biologically, um, but there's also a lot of important ecology or ecological um, reasons for why these animals are important. Right. And uh, behind you now, I have some of the video of a larvation swarm where you can just see all of those globs there are those different mucus nets there of of the larvation. So uh, Kakani, uh, maybe before we go to Emily and some audience questions, uh, can you describe to us uh, what it's like to be essentially studying those mucus homes there? You're a realtor for for mucus, uh, an assessor of, uh, of larvation mucus property, essentially, right? Right. I mean, so in Monterey Bay, we, we see a number of different species of larvations. Um, we also see them range in depth um, anywhere from near the sea surface for the smallest uh, species of larvations, but the giants uh, tend to um, be more prevalent uh, between, you know, 100 meters and, and down to 400 meters deep. And then that video that you saw of all these different larvations, you know, that's an example of how abundant these animals can get, uh, at least here in Monterey Bay. Um, and What's incredible is that these animals are you know, able to secrete these mucus structures that just look incredibly complex. Um, and we think they do that on a daily cycle. Oh, wow. All right, on the yeah. daily. Okay, so uh, with that, let's just bring, let me see, let's bring the rest of the group here back up in view because uh, at this point, before we go directly into your research there, Kakani, I know that the rest of the folks here on screen have uh, been looking at tons and tons of questions. Emily, uh, what are the kinds of questions that, that we've been getting here for Kakani to, to answer just very quick before we dive even deeper yeah. into the mucus house? No, that is a, a, a great, <laughs> great question there, Patrick. Um, I think a lot of folks are just wondering why larvations? Um, like, what is their what is their purpose in the deep sea, Kakani? Well, purpose is an interesting question or word, but what we've learned over the years is kind of their impact on their environment, right, and how they play a key role in a number of things. Um, researchers before you know my time in the mid two thousands, including Bruce Robison, who I believe has been on the the live stream in the past. You know, he has done a lot of great work showing that, you know, these animals contribute pretty significantly to carbon cycling. Um, and the fact that, you know, these animals are uh, using their mucus houses to filter a lot of water and trap and contain a lot of carbon. And by these animals swimming off and abandoning um, mucus houses uh, that readily sink to the bottom, and in some cases about 800 meters per day, you know, they play an important role in sequestering carbon from near surface waters uh, down to the bottom. Uh, another important thing that we've learned um, more recently is the fact that these animals can filter large quantities of water. So in some cases up to 80 liters per hour. Um, and one way we try to kind of understand or scale that up is 
uh, look at the number of animals that we see in Monterey Bay and also use those filtration rate measurements to you know, get a sense that these animals at least together have the capability or the capacity for filtering you know, about 200 meters of water depth within Monterey Bay you know, in less than two weeks. Um, so that's pretty astonishing for an animal that could range you know, in size from two centimeters or three centimeters up to 10 centimeters. Um, and then another thing that I think that's really important and I wanted to share is the fact that we've also observed these animals um, consuming microplastics. And this is a work that Anela Choi, who was uh, formerly a part of Mbari, but also um, uh, collaborated a lot with the aquarium, who's now at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Um, but her work has essentially shown how these animals can play an important role in transporting plastics from near the sea surface, right? That's the source of plastics is, is us, and then down to the ocean depths. So there's at least those three important reasons for why you know, larvations are um, you know, useful or the roles that they play in, in the deep sea. Awesome, thank you. Back to you, Emily, for if there are any more questions and then we'll, uh, we'll go to some more research. Emily, what, what do the folks wanna know? Yeah, we had a great question over on YouTube. They were wondering just how we're able to tell what these different structures in the larvation are doing, Kakani. Are we doing any kind of mathematical or computational work with them to kind of support what, uh, what you're saying right now? Uh, well, so that is a great question because I haven't had yet uh, much of a chance to explain or describe the ways in which we've been studying these structures. Um, so one of the uh, most recent research efforts that my lab has been involved with uh, was recently, um, you know, being shared, um, you know, through a number of outlets is the fact that we now have the capability to measure and quantify these mucus and gelatinous structures that we find in the deep sea. And the way we're able to do that is uh, using a combination of robotics, like these remotely operated vehicles, um, as well as some new imaging technology that we've developed over the past five years. Um, and that system is uh, called Deep PIV. And um, you can see at least the red in this photo that's behind me that red light is actually from the laser that we use in our imaging system, DPIV, um, that illuminates a sheet of light. And so what we've been able to show is that by using the remotely operated vehicle or the robot and scanning it fore and aft or forward and backward through an animal like a larvation and its mucus house, we can come up with you know, three-dimensional reconstructions of the entire mucus structure. And so when we do, once we do that, that's when computation becomes really important, right? Because it's one thing to kind of generate these image, images like you see behind me of what the mucus structure looks like at different points within the volume. And then using you know, computer programs, we can reconstruct what that entire structure looks like um, using those images that we've collected. And I don't know if Patrick can uh, do me a solid and show one of those 3D reconstructions. Yes. Um, yes, can do. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, keep keep going. Sorry, that was just me saying keep yes. Keep going. Okay. Yeah. Um, these 3D reconstructions. Um, once you have these measurements, you can do a number of different things with them. Um, for instance, one of the things we we started doing was um, you know uh, export these uh, these files to. Uh, VR, virtual reality renderers, so people can actually um, experience and go inside and understand or investigate how all these different structures are connected. Um, we, the other um, aspect though, aside from the models, is that the um, laser instrument also allows us to see the motion of fluid, the motion of water that's moving in and around the house. And it's that combined um, view, both flow or fluid motion, as well as these mucus structures that allow us to at least initially understand how water moves in and around the structure and what each particular um, feature, um, what, what kind of role those features play. 
Um, but I should add, you know, this is very, very early on in this process of trying to understand, you know, these mucus houses fully, you know, what aspects of the structure um, play an important role maybe in passively selecting food. Um, but the point is, is, you know, this is really just a starting point and these three-dimensional reconstructions or models are going to get us to where we want to eventually wind up. Awesome. And Kakani, I just switched over to the dye in the background. If you want to describe how the dye is, is working. Right. I should say that, um, so DPIV, that instrument is equipped with a lot of different features. So we've got, you know, the laser, uh, for illumination. We also have, um, the imaging, like the actual camera itself that captures what's going on in the laser sheet. Uh, we also have another um, pair of cameras that give, you know, the ROV pilots, the people who are ma maneuvering or positioning the, the vehicle or the instrument for these measurements um, context. So like, where is the instrument relative to the animal or targeted interest? Um, but we also have the capability of injecting non-toxic dyes into the water so that we can see at least roughly, you know, how is water moving in and around these structures. And this step is kind of an initial step that we take for a lot of our observations, because anytime you come across, you know, an animal that we don't know very much about or a system we don't know very much about, um, these dive visualizations give us a rough sense or rough idea of how water is moving in and around it. Um, and so that information we then use to target our measurements then using the laser system. That's amazing. And uh, I'm honestly just enjoying myself playing all of the different <laughs> clips there in the background because this is the first time that I'm seeing so many of these Kakani talking about larvations for, uh, for so many years and seeing that beautiful image of the lungs there the, of the larvations, you know, that, that mucus net. And so to finally be able to see how it's looking, I mean, I hope people are, are enjoying seeing these images. Uh, yeah, just want to say congratulations on getting all of this stuff out there because I know it's been a long time coming. Oh yeah, we're, we're so excited that, you know, we're, we can finally share uh, this stuff um, with, you know, people outside of our immediate, you know, collaborators or um, Adam Bari. Um, I should say too, what we're hoping to do within the next couple of weeks is release uh, these three-dimensional models um, you know, to the public through uh, the Ambari Sketchfab um, page. So stay tuned for that um, because we, you know, essentially want everyone to have the ability to kind of observe and engage with, you know, these animals that, you know, we're finding in these really difficult to access places like the deep sea. That's amazing. Uh, going over to you, Emily, what kind of questions do the folks have with all those graphics going on in the background? Yeah. We actually have had a lot of questions uh, come in, Kakani, since you mentioned microplastics. I know it's something that's on a lot of people's minds right now. Um, so let's kind of hit the big one that's out there right now. Are these larvations actually digesting the microplastics or are they just excreting them again? What's happening when they actually are eating and collecting those microplastics in that mucus net? Great, great question. Um, and fortunately, I do have a few answers for you. Uh, we did a, a study about this specifically with giant larvations, um, I think only a year or two ago. Um, what we um, did was, you know, using the DPIV instrument, um, instead of releasing dye, we had released, you know, small particles to try and understand, you know, what's the size range of particulate that these animals are ingesting. Um, and as part of that process, right, we not only changed the size um, of particles that we were observing, um, these, uh, I should say the size range, I believe was like from 10 micron up to 600 micron diameters. Um, the animals will, were, you know, readily ingested all of them. So you can actually visually see um, these particles uh, go into the animal's mouth and inside of the animal's gut. Um, and as part of that process, we then collected these animals after we observed them feeding on all of these particles and then bring, brought those animals up to the surface to observe, right? Like what's the fate of the plastics as well as these animals, right? You know, is the microplastics like um, harming these animals in any way? And, and what at least our initial observation showed was that um, within six to 12 hours, these animals had not only like 
um, ate them, put, uh, placed them in their guts, but then they'd also, you know, for lack of a better word, pooped them out into, you know, like these fecal pellets or these packets that were, you know, negatively buoyant. Um, so what that means is, you know, now these animals have the ability to package microplastics, not only in their mucus houses, you know, the, where um, they can be stuck in these mucus structures, but also in these fecal pellets that readily sink to the bottom. Um, and so that is at least based on some observations we've done with a number of animals, uh, specifically giant larvations here in Monterey Bay. And Kakania, a follow-up on that, I think it might surprise a lot of people to know that there is a lot of pla um, plastic, microplastics that is found in the deep sea and maybe more than what one would expect based on what you might find on the on the surface and what you're describing there is uh, I think what some students out there may have heard as the biological pump of uh, moving things through the through the ocean and so uh, this sinking of microplastics from the deep sea is something that that your team and other folks have been working on in the deep sea where there's m you know at times more microplastic down deeper than near the surface partly because of the biological activity is that is that uh is that about Am I making sense with that? Kakani, are you there? Uh oh. Oh no. Oh no. I tried to ask a follow-up question and we <laughs> broke it. You broke Kakani. Well, we'll just hang out over here. We can look at some more uh, videos. We'll see if we can get Kakani back here on the line. Uh, in the meantime, we do have backup presenters here from Mbari that will suddenly become larvation, uh, <laughs> larvation experts here. Um, but hey, Emily, any questions here? I'll, I'll put us here. Uh, let's see. Let me get rid of this. Let's just go back over here to the larvation beating its tail there and moving particles there through the mucus net. And we'll wait to get Kakani back on the line. Yeah. Well, I don't know if we want to talk about this or if we want to surprise <laughs> invite uh, Susan Cassie or George in to, to answer one of these questions yeah. here. But um, yeah. I know that we mentioned at the very beginning of um, of the stream that larvations are are uh, somewhat closely related to us humans here on land. So folks were wondering just how old evolutionarily uh, larvations are, and, and if we know that since they are such a squishy, gelatinous animal. Yeah, Susan, George. Who feels like being <laughs> Kakani's <Robin>. replacement? Cassie? <laughs> Anybody? What do you think? I, I'll, I'll jump in. I am not. So this is Susan. Um, oh. I am, I'm not. Oh, an, wait, Kakani's oh, back. Oh, we have Kakani back. Let's put her oh, on yay. the <laughs> Oh, thank goodness. Wait, 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 wait. It depends on the question. <laughs> So we, we were asked the meaning of life and uh, yeah, we tried. What? <laughs> no, 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 no. We, we, I should go off again. <laughs> <laughs> there was a, uh, there was a question about um, uh, evolutionarily speaking, how old Bathocordaeus uh, might be. Um, so what do you think? Can I phone a friend? <laughs> yeah. Well, so it's, it's a good it's a good question, everybody. I'm I'm pretty sure that that might even be unknown. So uh, we'll get Bruce Robeson on the line and have him and have him make something up for us. <laughs> Welcome back, Akani. Thank thanks for being there. Okay. Uh, let me see. Let's. Uh, um. Oh, one graphic that I have, Kakani, I wanted to to pull it up here uh, real quick. Is there's this really cool photo of uh, that 3D reconstruction and the water flow inside the, the larvation house. Can, I'm gonna put that up in the background and then can you describe it? It's the, it's the one with the arrows pointing uh, which direction the, the flow is, is going. So here, it's up on screen now and then I'll put you up there. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the water flow that is going on with uh, with these arrows here that you have in that in that uh, diagram? It's really fascinating to me just to kind of see this mucus house kind of represented in a more solid way. All right, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm after getting kicked off the internet. I'm now trying to uh, figure out where we were. Um, so the video that you're showing. This one's just the still image diagram uh that you have in your paper i believe oh yes i see it now um 
So uh, the image that you see on the left is, so in blue is the animal and the kind of grayish structure is the mucus house. Uh, we call it the inner house um, because um, there's not only an inner structure, there's also an outer one. Um, and this, uh, specifically what you're seeing is actually a cutaway. So if you were to slice the house, uh, the inner house, you know, in by, you know, through one of the, the main chambers, um, what you'll see, what you can see is some of the interior features. Um, that red thing um, may not be very obvious, but that's an eye. So say as a, you know, a viewer perspective, you were in that orientation looking down one of the chambers, you would see that image um, that's on the right. And so you'll notice the arrows, the thickness of the arrows indicate kind of relative flow speeds. And so water, um, thicker area arrows are moving downwards into that chamber. And then on either side of that chamber, there are these smaller finger-like chambers um, that are, you know, I, I just said smaller, but you can see that those um, arrows, then water moves up into them. And then what happens is, is each one of those chambers actually are connected um, and reach this, what we call a buccal tube, which is effectively a straw that the animal um, has in its mouth that then all its concentrated particles and food then wind up in its mouth uh, for the animal to feed on. Um, and so these models are incredible because they allow us to not only see and you know, interrogate the exterior surfaces of this mucus structure, but also look at the inside. And you know, that's something uh, we haven't been able to achieve um, until now, thanks to that technology. That's really fascinating. Uh, thank you for sharing. I'm going to bring everybody back up on screen here. Uh, oh, I'll get rid of this image. Uh, Emily, what did the folks want to know about uh, that? Because that was pretty, pretty incredible yeah. stuff. Well, I mean, with all of us up on screen right now, uh, Patrick, we actually had uh, a very pressing and important question from uh -huh. Jen over on Facebook. She wants to know what all of our cool backgrounds are. Here <laughs> on. We all have these awesome deep sea backgrounds. So I don't know if we want to go around the room here and, uh, and talk about what's behind us. Sure. Susan, you want to start? Sure. So my um, animal of choice here is called Apolemia. It's a siphonophore. I, this is one of my favorite images in Ambari's entire database because um, it's it's this really sh shaggy animal. It was just described. This is called Apolemia lanosa. It was described just within the last five to ten years, and it's I would say it's relatively uncommon. Um, you know, as someone who watched video every day for nearly 18 years, I would say I saw them maybe once a month or something like that. So they weren't very, very common. And they can get really long, like on the order of many meters, a few meters long. Awesome. Uh, I guess I'll put myself up. So uh, behind me is the template for the cover image for this live stream. So you can see Batho Cordaeus, if I can get out of the way. There it is. You can see that very famous photo uh, that I've been seeing for many years um, and double um, double logos right now because of the streaming software and everything going on, which so I didn't think that one through. But anyway, uh, that is uh, Batho Cordaeus, the giant larvation we've been talking about with that inner house that Kakani was just describing. And then we'll go over to Emily here. Sorry, Hi. Patrick. Sorry. Yes. Right. Before moving on, I want to add a, a few things about that animal, which yes. I think is interesting. So going back to Patrick's photo, oh. sorry, Emily. Um, That's okay. <laughs> uh, so that that specific uh, giant larvation, that is Bath Bathocordius magnetii. Um, it was recently, recently described. It's actually named after um, Dr. Marsha McNutt who is actually was formerly the you know director of Mbari, but she's currently now the president of the National Academy of Sciences. And she's a really well-known geoscientist. So just wanted to call that out. That's awesome. That's awesome. Cool. My background's a learning opportunity. Sweet. Hey. <laughs> okay. Back over to Emily. 
Um, my background, uh, which was the same as George George's just a second ago, but I see that you have switched chairs in the meantime, George, understandably. Um, Sly. I just have some marine snow fallen behind me. It's, you know, a nice wintry wonderland in the deep sea all year round. Uh, but marine snow, not actually snow. These are all just um, pieces of detritus and organic material and poop and snot and do you name it raining down from the surface and uh, a lot of what larvations are catching in that mucus net of theirs. So I've got a nice uh, meal for the larvations uh, drifting away behind me here today. Awesome. All right. We're back to Kakani. We've talked a little bit about it, but uh, the red uh, lighting there in the background for people just joining us is probably pretty interesting. So what's behind you, Kakani? Right. So this... Um this animal here is Bathocordius um, stygius. So it's a smaller cousin of McNutti that's in Patrick's uh, image. And uh, the red light that you see there, that's actually uh, illumination uh, from a laser, a laser sheet that's part of the deep PIV instrument um, that we're using to reconstruct these mucus structures and these animals uh, in their natural environment. Awesome. And then we'll go to George, who got tricky and uh, switched over to his preferred animal uh, on a live stream. So a, a larvation is fun. But uh, can you tell us, George, who you got behind you? That's right. I had to switch mostly because Emily had the same background as I did. So I didn't want to duplicate it. But this is a, a deep sea tinafore, a red, a red tinafore that was described by Ambari researchers. And would that Embari researcher Hi, be Mari you? Researchers. Would that be you, George? <laughs> I, I might have been one of those. <laughs> you have to tell its name. We want to give its scientific name, George. Lampoteus Corinthi Venter, the bloody belly tinafore. Awesome. Awesome. Well done, everybody. Okay, we got the whole panel back up here on uh, screen. And uh, here, maybe I'll put us in the lower corner here and play some. Uh, play some Bathocordaeus uh, video while we go. Emily, do we have any questions uh, for, for Kakani right now? Absolutely. First, a very quick update uh, uh, from uh, someone who is watching over on Facebook um, about the evolutionary date of when uh, these larvations may have arrived. Um, chordates were thought to first arrive in the Cambrian about 500 million years ago, but there's no really specific date for larvations. So something that is still to be determined there. Um, so and, quick. And uh, actually, uh, let's just say thanks to Amanda Kahn for, um, for yeah. that help. She is a professor at Moss Landing Marine Labs, and she was an Ambari postdoc. So thanks. Whoa, to Amanda. nice. <laughs> Thank you, Amanda. Keep, keeping the answers. I in found a family. friend. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good friend to phone there. Um, this uh, was a really great question that we had. Uh, Kakani, does this type of imaging that you're doing with the larvations help understand their effect on other organisms in their ecosystems as well? Um, I mean, absolutely. Um, you know, the fact that we're able to, you know, measure how much water these animals may be processing or, um, you know, the rates at which they're able to do um, some of these things. Um, you know, as you can imagine, the ocean, including the deep ocean, is a really interconnected place. Um, and so as we understand, you know, what an one animal is doing and what role it plays in that environment, um, slowly but surely we'll start to understand how you know it may impact other animals too. Um, I'm sure Susan and George may have some other uh, insight they could share um, with that question. Or not. Or just or just leave you sitting inside. <laughs> no That's problem. okay. That's okay. Looks like we, uh, we've got Cassie <laughs> coming back into the call. Uh, let's see. Let's go to uh yeah i'm just i'm just talking to myself now on the stream uh here you go emily another question from the folks all right uh kakani how long have we been studying larvations just years decades have we known about them for a long time um well that's a really good question and i mean it depends so if, if you're talking about the 
you know, smaller larvations, um, the group Oikopleura, I mean, we've, uh, researchers have been doing, um, you know, studies on those animals for a very, very long time, you know, decades. Um, giant larvations, though, um, I think would be a little bit more recently, um, within, you know, the last, I think, five or six decades. And a lot of that is just because of how difficult it is to, you know, find them and observe them. Because uh, when you think about it, just historically, the way in which we observed, you know, animals in the deep ocean would really involve just dragging really large nets, you know, and behind boats and try to capture whatever is inside of that net. And, you know, this is true for all gelatinous animals, not to mention, you know, an animal that makes a mucus structure. Uh, when you pull up a, a giant net full of animals, you know, these gelatinous animals, especially these mucus structures, do not fare well in, in, with that kind of treatment. And so it wasn't until, you know, the advent of robotics, um, along with, you know, underwater imaging, um, have people been able to realize that, you know, an animal that's nearly unrecognizable that was a larvation was also associated with this large mucus structure that it lived inside. Um, and so, you know, really we're, we're talking within the last 30 years of, you know, with this advent of technology, this improvement of technology that we've been able to finally observe these animals in their natural environment. That's awesome. Here, I'm going to uh, just put myself up on screen here real quick, just because uh, I want to play here uh, in the background uh, a giant larvation sinker uh, that we have a video of there. That's one of those discarded mucus nets uh, after the the larvation is done with it, and here is um, a collecting uh, a collecting arm of one of the ROVs, remotely operated vehicles there from from Mbari, collecting that larvation sinker. Uh, so I just wanted to play those and then transition back to uh, you, Kakani, to uh, ask you a leading question, which is: uh, There's a really really amazing animal that probably a lot of people have heard about in the deep sea, maybe one of their favorite deep sea. Uh, animals that feeds on larvation sinkers. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the vampire squid's diet with uh, with these sinkers? Ah, yeah. <laughs> I can change my um, background if uh, oh that to would show vampire toothus. That'd be awesome. Yeah. So uh, just for you folks out there who might be wondering, you know, larvations, giant larvations. We've talked about them for a while. Oh, there we go. Hold on. They Sorry. nice. <laughs> so behind you is, uh, is the vampire squid Kakani, right? Right. And uh, you know, these are a crowd favorite. I know several people who absolutely love these animals. The ROV pilots love these animals. They've got like stickers on the remotely operated vehicle that says we'll break for vamps. Um, but anyways, these animals have these uh, this feeding tentacle that it extends out. Um, and when you think about this name, the vampire squid, you know, you think about blood, you think about, you know, guts and other unsavory things. But, you know, these animals aren't actually um, meat eaters. They, they feed on detritus. They feed on sinking dead animals and plants. And this feeding tentacle essentially, you know, reaches out and then um, things that collect on top of it. Um, the animal then is able to um, um, kind of bring into its mouth and then feed on. Um, so it's uh, an interesting ad adaptation to living in, in the deep sea. Right. And so uh, I just wanted to bring that up because we've been talking about those uh, mucus nets for for a little bit. And uh, the video playing right now behind all of us is a vampire squid eating one of those mucus nets. So you can kind of think about it as eating someone else's deep sea booger where the net is uh, clogged <laughs> with uh, the net is clogged with food. And so that is helping not only we were talking about sinking, uh, sinking plastic into the deep sea, but you know, the main role of this is sinking food down in the deep sea or one of the main things that it ends up doing. And so many other animals are being fed by that. And that's what's behind uh, Emily there, that uh, marine snow, a lot of little larvation bits. So anyway, tying it all together. So if you weren't too happy about the whole talk of mucus houses and all, all that stuff, just it's, it's vampire squid food. So there we go. Now we've just made everyone else happy there at home. Okay. All of us as a panel are up on screen right now. And Emily, what kind of questions do we have here? Yeah. 
uh, Janet over on Facebook was wondering, Kakani, is it possible to do PIV on non-transparent animals? That, um, thank you for that question. Uh, so for those of you who don't know what PIV stands for, um, PIV is particle image velocimetry. Um, so it's actually a technique that's been used by engineers and laboratories for, gosh, since the 80s, I think, or 90s, um, to try and understand how uh, water moves in and around, you know, let's say turbines or over wings. And then also more recently, trying to understand how, you know, animals swim and fly. And so uh, PIV, like I said, was a common technique used in the laboratories, only recently um, being kind of repackaged and, and used uh, in C2 or in a natural environment like the ocean. Um, and the way that works is, you know, using a laser or some high powered source of illumination uh, or light um, and then imaging to capture motion of, you know, whatever uh, media um, that you're interested in. I should also say that, you know, in order to do this technique, um, right, water is transparent. You can't really see it. And so what people do is add particles or other light scatters into water. Um, and so it's the motion of those um, sources, those particles um, that gives us a proxy or, you know, an estimate for what water is doing, like how is it flowing and moving. And so the way we do this, at least with PIV, we use a laser sheet um, and that laser sheet of light will penetrate into gelatinous tissues really, really well. Um, one of the challenges though, is when you're um, doing these measurements on non-transparent objects, you know, like let's say hard substrates with coral or sponges, um, which we've tried. And, and unfortunately we don't have very much success um, trying to measure flows inside of those um, non-transparent or non-gelatinous tissues. Um, but what we do do, however, is um, uh, look at kind of external uh, flows. For example, actually working with Amanda Kahn at the Moss Landing Marine Labs, you know, we're looking at how we can use the DPIV instrument to measure uh, filtration rates or water X current leaving the siphons of sponges uh, in the deep sea. And so that is an example of imaging, you know, an animal that isn't transparent, but looking at flow that the that animal generates uh, to understand how it, you know, interacts or impacts its environment. So that's a long winded answer, but I'm hoping that gives you some detail. No, that was excellent. Thank you so much for all that information. This mm -hmm. is so this is so fascinating, uh, Kakani, to to finally hear from um, from from you with all of the findings because uh, we've been we've been seeing bits and pieces here and there at the aquarium uh, for a long time. So this is really really cool. I did want to uh, mention just in case we mm -hmm. forgot, huge shout out to those ROV pilots for keeping uh, that instrument there in place because. Uh, these clips just look absolutely seamless, but I can imagine, uh, Kakani, that it's a, it's a rather frustrating experience uh, on board the, the the ship for the for the pilot. Am I correct in that? Yeah, fortunately, we don't record all the audio in the control room. <laughs> <laughs> sure, we do. No. <laughs> Actually, we I just, just want to say this is Susan again, and um, it really is remarkable how the pilots like the patience that it takes, it takes hours. We spend, I would say probably, you know, an entire day, 12 hours at sea diving. And we may get, uh, we may try five, six, seven different animals. And you know, how many of those turn into actual video that Kakani can use the data. It's really painstakingly, uh, a, a lot of work to do this. Yeah, and I was going to mention, I mentioned it on Facebook, but these houses are just made up out of mucus, right? They're, they're incredibly fragile. And so any water movement makes them go away. And just to be able to see these intact is amazing. And then when you think that we're doing it with a remotely operated vehicle that in, case, in the case of uh, Doc Ricketts is an 11 ton vehicle right? I mean, it's huge. And it's working up to 4,000 meters below the sea, although most of these houses are around are less than 1,000 meters down. Um, 
but the fact that they could maintain position without disturbing the water so that Kakani could get this information, it's, it's just amazing. I mean, it, it takes a, a team of people to make this happen. And uh, one of the explanations I like to give about, you know, the challenges of doing this kind of work or this kind of measurement is, you know, imagine a, an 11 ton vehicle, a, a giant, a really large remotely operated vehicle that's um, being operated by a pilot who's sitting on a ship. Um, that vehicle might be 200, 400 meters deep. Um, but what we're asking them to do is put a one millimeter thick laser sheet, you know, like this thick, um, and have it on an animal who's roughly, you know, a centimeter across or centimeter wide. And, you know, depending on if we want the 3D reconstructions or if we want to look at flow, either hold position, you know, relative to that target for a period of time or move the vehicle in some controlled fashion to do those scans. And, you know, it, it's not something you can just do out of the box. And, and that's part of the reason why, you know, we've been developing not only the instrument, but also these operation, this operational know-how uh, to try and do this um, pretty effectively um, in the deep sea. And I should say, you know, we've demonstrated this technique, the, this instrumentation on all of Ambari's remotely operated vehicles. Um, we have three different ones, the Ricketts, Doc Ricketts, uh, Rachel, gosh, Fentana, and the Mini ROV. And then we're also in the process of transferring uh, that tech and using it on um, the Falcor Schmidt Ocean Inst Institute's research vessel as well. So we're hoping that, you know, a lot of, with all of these models that we're generating, it's going to um, build interest in, in trying to kind of non-invasively observe and reconstruct what these animals um, look like in their natural environment. That's awesome. That's so yeah, cool. Really amazing. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We'll put the rest of the group up. I mean, yeah, truly amazing stuff. So, uh, you know, shout out to all the kids out there that are getting really good at their drone uh, racing and uh, Fortnite uh, builds. Uh, that manual dexterity is going to come in handy when uh, you decide to come and join the, the the deep sea researcher core out there. We need we need that dexterity. Uh, so keep so for the parents out there that are that are watching. Um, if they're playing video games, just say as long as they're training for deep sea ROV piloting, that's totally fine. We Monterey Bay Aquarium and Ambari approved. Re remind them though that they also need to do a little engineering because yes, pilots are also responsible for fixing the vehicle when something breaks. That's right. So build your own ROV and pilot that. You're good to go. Yeah, I mean, I should also say, you know, the pilots contribute to the development of all the different instruments that you know Ambari uh, flies, and so they're an important member of the the development team. Anytime we have new tech that's spun up. Awesome, that's so cool. And uh, can you remind? Sorry, Kakanya, I have you up on on screen here. What's that website? We'll we'll link it below that website for the for the three D reconstructions that I know uh, pilot Ben Irwin um, puts a lot of stuff up on there. What is that again? Right. So that's uh, Sketchfab. Uh, and Bari has a Sketchfab uh, page, so you can actually go and check that out and see you know, a, a few of our 3D reconstructions that we've done on some gelatinous animals, but also predominantly models that. Ben Irwin, an ROV pilot, has uh, generated using, um, you know, the science camera imagery um, on a number of different things, you know, um, coral or, um, you know, uh, shipwrecks. There's a lot of material there that you can check out. Awesome. And I have uh, one of those 3D reconstructions behind you now. I'll bring the rest of the panel up. Uh, let's see. We're at 50 minutes here streaming. So we're approaching Kakani, the lightning round uh, there to stump you coming up very, very soon. It won't take very long. <laughs> just, just kidding. Uh, Emily, what kind of questions do the folks have out there for us? Yeah, I'm going to kind of combine two of the questions that we got here. Um, Kakani, do we know or do we have any idea yet of how these larvations are able to create such complex shapes and structures with that mucus net. And after they drop them, how fast can they create a new one? I think I can answer this partially uh, or mostly. Uh, so 
what we know a, about a lot about the giant larvations, we actually infer from smaller larvations, particularly Oikopleura, that uh, researchers um, elsewhere have fig figured out how to culture. Um, and so what they've been able to show um, is that, you know, these animals, um, you know, have cells that lie in their heads. And um, there's a recognition that these different cells um, play important roles in generating different features in the mucus house. Um, the other thing too is researchers have figured out um, how different proteins um, are made up, make up the mucus uh, structures, and also you know what genes play you know like a, what genes play a specific role in in expressing different kinds of um, proteins that are called oikosins. Um, but in the case of the giant larvations, um, what Again, what we what we say, um, we've been able to identify specific cells, um, but we're not really able to understand how this action of a number of different cells, you know, generating mucus can work together to create these structures that have such complexity. So that's still an open question, and I'm hopeful that these new imaging techniques will allow us to understand the, these specific relationships between different structures in the house versus different um, cells or protein expression. Um, I should also say, at least with the giant larvations, um, we have, as far as I know, in the history of Mbari, we've only come across a giant larvation building its house um, from, you know, the initial rudiment, so the initial kind of excretion of um, mucus on the, on the head, and that a rudiment can be, you know, a millimeter or two millimeters across. And then through a variety of different, let's say, um, kinematics or body motions, uh, this animal can then expand the house to the full size that we normally see. Um, and so this process, we were very, very fortunate um, to observe this a couple years ago. Um, at the same time, we were deploying deep PIV. And so this is a paper I'm trying to write up now but the fact is, is we have three-dimensional reconstructions at different points of, you know, this expansion process of the mucus house. So I'm really excited to be able to share that with everyone once I'm done uh, writing that paper. Um, and uh, in terms of how quickly they do that, I mean, based on that one observation, uh, you know, from rudiment to full expansion, that happened in less than an hour. Um, but back to an earlier question, you know, the hypothesis, and this is thanks to uh, Bruce's earlier work, um, is that these animals build houses every 24 hours. Um, smaller larvations, oikopleura, can do that every four hours. Um, but for us to really understand or know how often these houses are built and this process of like expansion and feeding and then abandonment and then moving on and, and building another house, I mean, we really need longer duration observations, be able to conduct longer duration observations of these animals uh, in their natural environment. And um, let me tell you, I think we're going to be there. We're pretty close. We've been working with a number of different individuals and institutions to develop a new class of underwater vehicles that will do just that, um, autonomously track uh, larvation as it lives its life for at least 24 hours. Um, so maybe in the next two years, I'll be able to report back. That's wow, awesome. that's so really cool. cool. Yeah. I'm so excited about all that. <laughs> That's so awesome. There's a lot of um, wonderful technology and, you know, thanks to our fantastic collaborators all over the place, you know, at Stanford and Woods Hole and University of Texas. I mean, that's an exciting development that I'm hoping we'll be able to share um, stuff soon with you all. Oh, yeah. man. And uh, right. are you planning on naming your first larvation that undergoes the surveillance Truman um, for the Truman Show reference? Or is that still up in the air that's my suggestion well i was thinking about naming it after my dog because she kieran because she creepily stares oh. at me <laughs> like outside of the, room. the kieran show the kieran show that's awesome yeah. okay uh well emily i'm looking at the time 55 minutes give or take here so uh we're coming up on a couple of rapid fire questions for you kakani generally and then and then we'll think about wrapping up uh emily what do we got for all right. I'm going to combine 
three of the questions that we got here into one because they're all kind of have to do with the same thing here kakani how common are larvations in the deep sea how when we go down there how how often do we find them and what's our strategy for trying to find a larvation in the deep sea Ooh, multi-layered questions those are always a lot of fun uh so i should say that you know in terms of uh, instrumentation or observational capacity throughout our ocean, we don't have that yet. Um, but what I'm able to speak to is at least, you know, what we do in Monterey Bay, because, you know, our, that region is arguably one of the most heavily instrumented places uh, in our ocean. Um, and so what we do know is that um, the abundance of larvations uh, is seasonal. Uh, we see an increase in their numbers uh, starting in the summer, um, you know, that rises until kind of late summer and fall, and then their abundance numbers drop um, through the winter. Uh, and so that kind of data is enabled by these um, midwater time series data sets that uh, Bruce Robeson uh, has been collecting for the past 30 years. Um, and then, gosh, what was the other question, layer to that question? How do we find them? How do we find them? Yeah. So because of this midwater time series, um, we here, you know, doing work at in Monterey Bay, um, have this wonderful resource that's called the you know video annotation reference system uh, or the deep sea guide, uh, dsg.embari.org. And what it is is actually, you know, based on all these years, like 30 years of um, vehicle collected data we have what essentially amounts to like a Google search for animals in Monterey Bay, um, which outputs something like, um, you know, depth distributions of specific animals. And so over the years, this data has, you know, provided us um, a general kind of depth range where we can find these animals. So for instance, Bathycordius um, mcnutti, you know, we can find those roughly between, you know, 100 and 200 meters deep. And so that initial kind of search range is what we rely on when we're trying to go out and find these animals. Um, but I should say that um, these larvation houses are, are really distinct structures compared to some of the other things that we see um, in midwater. And we've been developing actually machine learning algorithms that can um, not only automate the detection, but also the classification of these structures uh, in midwater uh, to try and you know, automate tracking, but also acquisition of these targets for future robots um, that will you know, search and discover animals in, in the deep sea. So th there's all these layers of information and, and data and technology that we're trying to incorporate and you know really enable these discoveries um, in you know the short and long term. That's awesome. Thank you so much for that. And I think uh, the the final question for you, Kakani, that uh, that we always want to do for all of the aspiring deep sea biologists that are tuning in out there: um, How do they get involved? How do they get to do the type of work that that you are doing? How did you get to this point? Well, that's a great question because I, my route to what I'm doing now um, was definitely not a direct one, um, rather circuitous. Um, my background is actually in aerospace engineering of all things. Um, wanted to and actually still want to be uh, an astronaut, but that's a whole nother uh, topic. Uh, basically, you know, fantastic, in order to do a lot of this work, because what I do is engineering, you know, I'm developing technology to enable, um, you know, collaborators and others to study this uh, difficult to access place. And so, um, you know, having a really solid background in mathematics, um, mechanics is, is very important. Um, and then also at least I feel I've been very fortunate to work with uh, really talented, you know, scientists and marine biologists who um, really convey to me what the important science questions are, so I can think about, okay, well, what technologies do we need to answer those questions? That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're glad you're hanging out with the sea stars with us for for the moment before you head out into the you know to the larger <laughs> stars if we lose you to space it's good that you're here studying inner space with all of us i've learned so much today uh, i don't know the rest of the panel emily i just feel so uh, enriched knowing 
all the cool stuff about those those mucus homes that's so cool yeah i know that these are animals that patrick and and myself have spoken to so many guests about with at the aquarium and to be able to learn more just from hanging out with you for an hour kakani has been absolutely delightful so great oh, well, thanks for having me on so awesome uh well i think with that everyone thank you so much for uh, tuning in and for joining us here for some bio inspiration with uh, Kakani. Thank you, Kakani, uh, so much. Thank you to our esteemed panel uh, for hopping in as well. Uh, Cassie and Susan and George uh, and Emily for fielding all of those questions. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, joining in. Uh, and we hope to see, deep see, you again soon at the Monterey Bay Aquarium and the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.